It's time to return to Albuquerque, to the ballad of Walter White, a family man who seemingly lives a normal life as a chemistry school teacher. However, after learning that he is terminally ill, Walter turns to a life of crime as a drug cook in order to leave money for his family once he is gone. Walter teams up with troubled former student Jesse Pinkman to help him in his new underground career turn, where both Walter and Jesse descend further and further into the dangerous criminal world of Albuquerque. And Walter evolves into the notorious drug crime lord Eisenberg. He also likes to stand around in his underpants, like, as in a lot. From 2008 to 2013, Breaking Bad captivated its audience and left them on the edge of their seats and eagerly coming back for more. It's a show which is now considered one of the greatest TV shows of all time. And for good reason. Because it is. <laughs> As you can see, I'm really excited about this because I love Breaking Bad. The characters and the way they are written, oh, just superb. So let's discover some things that you may not know about Breaking Bad as we explore the history of this amazing TV show. I definitely have the haircut for it. <laughs> and just before we go any further, just letting you all know there is going to be spoilers. So, let's check it out. Are you ready? Breaking Bad is the brainchild of producer, director, writer Vince Gilligan. He got his first dash with script writing when he wrote the dark romantic comedy Wilder Napalm. However, it was 1995 that he got his first big break when he joined the X-Files production at Fox and he would write episodes for the show, direct and even co-produce. Yep, Gilligan joining the X-Files seemed to be a match made in heaven. Now, X-Files original run had ended in 2002. However, Gilligan was planning on creating another iconic TV show. He wanted to create a story about a protagonist becoming an antagonist. And he felt that television was a great medium for telling such a story. As on TV, you can take your time and thus take several years to show the character's eventual descent into villainy. The basic premise was, what if you turned Mr. Chips into Scarface? Mr. Chips, of course, was a beloved school teacher from a 1934 novella, and Scarface being Tony Montana from the movie Scarface, a ruthless, powerful drug lord who rose to the top and required a small army to take him down. This premise is how we got Walter White, a mild-mannered, down-on-his-luck high school chemistry teacher who becomes Eisenberg, the most notorious crime lord of Albuquerque, New Mexico. In fact, the show's title itself, Breaking Bad, is a southern saying, which basically means to break free from the chains of authority and go wild and rebel. And one day, while talking with Breaking Bad's eventual co-producer, Thomas Snoz, who Gilligan also worked with on The X-Files, they were joking about how they were now unemployed and that they should buy an RV and turn it into a cooking lab. And, well, that's where that subplot was created. After writing a pilot episode, Gilligan took his script to Sony, who were enthusiastic. However, according to BusinessInsider.com, they had one request to change the location. You see, originally Breaking Bad was set in Riverside, California, but Sony insisted that if the production went to New Mexico instead, for taxation purposes, they could save a lot of money. So the show was now set in New Mexico, with some of the dry desert scenery in the show almost being its own character. So now the infamous journey of Walter White and Jesse Pinkman and their endeavors into crime had just begun. They were now Breaking Bad. Sony were then trying to find a network station to take on Breaking Bad. Now this was easier said than done, as it seems that no network were interested. First, Showtime were offered Breaking Bad, but they turned it down, as at that time the network was also working on the show Weeds, and they found Breaking Bad to be too similar. 
In fact, this actually could have marked the end of Breaking Bad, as show creator Vince Gilligan didn't know what Weeds was. He, he hadn't heard of the show yet, but upon learning more about it, he felt, yes, this is very much like his Breaking Bad script. Gilligan even stated that he wouldn't have made Breaking Bad if he knew about Weeds prior. However, the producers of Breaking Bad convinced Gilligan to pull through and that Breaking Bad would be different enough. TNT were then offered Breaking Bad and they said no. HBO were offered Breaking Bad and they said no. Given what a phenomenon Breaking Bad would become, aka a candidate for one of the greatest TV shows of all time, it's kind of insane that all these network stations were like, Puh, this show about a school teacher becoming a drug dealer after he's diagnosed with cancer? Ugh, who on earth would want to see that? Ugh. Finally, salvation did come in the form of FX, who were interested in Breaking Bad. Finally, a network who believed in the show. Finally, a network which would see this show get made. That is, until they got cold feet and scrapped Breaking Bad. This is because at that time, FX decided to make the TV show Dirt instead, which had a female lead, with them feeling that the network already had too many shows with men in the leads. So they chose Dirt over Breaking Bad. Spoilers, Dirt only lasted two seasons. Finally, a meeting was set up at AMC, but Gilligan, understandably, wasn't very enthusiastic. I guess he felt that everyone else was turning him down, why would AMC be any different? However, AMC were interested, but for the strangest of reasons. Because the network was about to release the series Mad Men, and wanted a show to release alongside it. And, well, that's it. That's all it took. And so the meeting took place, and Breaking Bad now found a home with AMC. However, after the initial meeting, it did take a year for the rights to be settled and for everything to fall into place. Yeah, this was not a quick and easy show to make. When it came to who could fill in the morally ambiguous shoes of Walter White, Gilligan always wanted Brian Cranston, as he previously worked with Cranston on the 1998 X-Files episode, Drive, where Cranston played a bigot with a terminal illness called Patrick Crump, who crosses paths with Fox Mulder. Gilligan felt that the character had to be both absolutely terrible, but also sympathetic at the same time, and thanks to his acting talents, Cranston could pull this off. So really, in many ways, Patrick Crump from X-Files is kind of like an early prototype of Walter White. However, the executives over at AMC weren't entirely convinced, probably because at that time, Cranston was more well known for his comical role in Malcolm in the Middle, where AMC considered other potential Walter Whites, including Matthew Broderick and John Cusack. Finally, the executives saw the X-Files episode which featured Cranston, where they thought, okay, this guy can do dark gritty drama too, other than being that guy from Malcolm in the Middle. Cranston also really helped with the creation of Walter White, from the character's backstory, wardrobe, and how he generally carried himself, taking inspiration from his own father, as well as that iconic mustache the character had in the first couple of seasons, which Cranston referred to as a dead, impotent caterpillar. Uh, yeah, of course, first thing that came into my head. <laughs> Also, there's just something about Cranston's voice. That character just came alive when Cranston would start talking with that strong, powerful voice of his. If you don't know who I am, maybe your best course would be to tread lightly. Say my name. Eisenberg. You're goddamn right. Now, when it came to Jesse Pinkman, Walter's young and manipulated partner in crime, actor Aaron Paul got the part. And once again, Gilligan had previously worked with Paul on The X-Files in an episode called Lord of the Flies. I swear the genesis of Breaking Bad is deep rooted within The X-Files. There originally was hesitation to cast Paul, as it was felt that he looked too much like a pretty boy to be a grimy street drug cook, as well as looking too old. However, it seems that he convinced everyone with his audition, and thus Jesse Pinkman was created. The tragic, yet naive, ill-advised former student of Walter White, 
who he is easily able to trick and manipulate into their descent into the dangerous criminal underworld. Yes, Pinkman is a pawn in White's schemes, but at the same time, as often as Walter could get frustrated with Pinkman, you do still sometimes get the sense that he does care about the character and is protective of him to a degree, creating a complex and fascinating double act in this compelling story. There are so many rich characters in Breaking Bad, just bursting with personality. Even seemingly background characters are written beautifully and compelling, leaving you wanting to know more about them, with almost Shakespearean complexities. Some of these iconic characters we get to meet in Breaking Bad include sleazy, comical, and highly questionable criminal lawyer Saul Goodman, played by Bob Odenkirk, a character bursting with so much allure and charisma, he would go on to get his own spin-off, Better Call Saul. Dean Norris as Hank, a DEA agent and Walter's brother-in-law. Although deep down he does care for Walter, he still looks down on him and sees Walter as being below him in the food chain, so to speak. The irony is, Walter was this powerful crime figure the whole time, which unbeknownst to Hank, totally defeated his superiority complex ego. Anna Gunn as Walter's wife, Skylar. Now, Skylar is an interesting character. I've noticed over the years there's lots of people online declaring their absolute hate for this character and how she's one of the most unlikable characters in TV history. And that's an interesting claim considering Breaking Bad is a TV show full of murderers and dangerous criminals. Then there's counter arguments from fans who are pro Skylar and say things like, no, she was just a tragic character. Justice for Skylar. Okay, so here's where I stand with Skylar. I don't like the fact that she cheated on Walter. It always came across to me that she did it to spite him. Yes, Walter got into crime, but he was actually doing that to help and provide for his family. At first, it was a selfless act. Just a very extremely misguided selfless act. Whereas her betrayal, she purely did for herself to get one up on Walter, which juxtaposed to his lies was more of a selfish act. But that said, man, by the end of the series, you can't help but feel sorry for her. And you can just see the hell that Walter is putting her through and how it's tearing her apart. So really, it's not as simple as, is she a good or bad character? Breaking Bad is, after all, all about exploring gray areas just like real life. Then there's Jonathan Banks as Mike, a hardened former cop who due to his troubled life is now a tough, no-nonsense cleaner for the criminal underworld. One thing to say about Mike is yes, he is in a life of crime and engages in questionable acts, but at the same time, there is a fairness about him. He wants to do the right thing by those who are important to him and he has a sense of loyalty. RJ Might as Walter White Jr., Walter's teenage son. Man, this kid is so innocent and so pure, it's almost heartbreaking. He's probably the only non-corrupted character in the show. Everyone in the show wants their own selfish agendas. All Walter White Jr. wants is breakfast. And Kristen Ritter as Jane, a former addict whose life takes a back turn when she gets involved with Jesse Pinkman. And wow, what a tragic character. If her fate doesn't leave you feeling really bad and with a lump in your throat and a hatred of Walter White, then you probably don't have a soul. As in soul, not soul. But what about some of the most truly feared and dangerous characters? Well, first there's Todd, played by Jesse Plemons, or as I've known him as, not quite Matt Damon a ruthless and brutal executioner who does something truly unforgivable. Hexa, played by Mark Magolis, a high up powerful member of the cartel who can't walk or talk due to suffering a stroke. And the only way he can communicate is by tapping on his bell. Tuco, played by Raymond Cruz, a very dangerous, paranoid, and out of control kingpin who will have no problem killing anyone and could do so at the drop of a hat. Now this is one nasty piece of work. He is so erratic and psychotic, you honestly would not want anything to do with him. Like seriously, this guy is just anger, fury, and murder incarnate. 
And finally, and I save the best for last, Gus, played by Giancarlo Esposito. The number one kingpin. The most powerful crime lord in town. Yep, it stops with Gus. And what makes Gus terrifying is that unlike Tuco, he's not erratic. He's well composed and respectable. He has discipline and decorum with plenty of class. But you just know that once you do something he doesn't like, your time is up. And the fact that he is usually so calm and smooth somehow makes him even more terrifying than Tuco. Now, Tuco is more of a force of nature, but Gus is the intellectual mastermind who is pulling all the strings. And although he doesn't look tough or like a physical threat, he still holds all the power. And everyone knows it. So if you can believe it, it was originally intended to feature the characters Pinkman and Hank only in season one. Yeah, originally the characters were to die at the end of the first season in a drug deal gone wrong. And that was to be the basis of the following series of Breaking Bad, which would focus on Walter White's guilt of Pinkman and Hank's deaths. So what changed this? Well, it was none other than a writer's strike. Okay, so here's what happened. Season one was meant to have nine episodes, but because of the strike, it could only produce seven, which meant the episode where Pinkman and Hank were to meet their grisly fates couldn't be produced. But due to the strike, the production got to take a breather and take some time out and reevaluate the show. And upon this reevaluation, it was felt that the show was progressing too fast. And it was also felt that Aaron Paul and Dean Nod Morris played their parts so well, it was decided to keep the characters going on as being a part of the show, thankfully. So there is definitely a very different path that the show could have taken. And it was felt within the production that the strike actually saved the show. But what are some of the show's most iconic moments? Well, I asked the Minty Comedic Arts Facebook page for the people who follow that page to reveal what their favorite moments in the show was. And these are some of the ones that kept appearing. Number one, Walter White throwing the pizza on the roof of his family home. Yep, that moment in a fit of anger where Walter White decides to give a pizza flying lessons where it lands on the roof. A true monument to the lack of control Walter actually has over his life and family. The pizza throw was actually performed in one take, and eagle-eyed viewers have noticed that the pizza wasn't sliced, probably in order to give it the perfect circle-shaped pizza on the roof, rather than having smaller slices scattered around the place, which admittedly wouldn't have been as funny. Commenter Mark Inman added that fans of the show still go to the house and throw pizzas at it, trying to get them on the roof. And if you're watching this video, please don't do that. Give me your pizza if you don't want it. Number two, the robot scene, where Jesse is trying to think of ways they can get their stranded RV out of the desert. <laughs> One of them was being build a robot. Walter then has an idea come to his head for getting them out, where in a fit of naivety, Jesse actually believed that Walter is going to build a robot. What are we building? You said it yourself. A robot. Commenter Kyle McGuinness pointed out that this was kind of foreshadowing, as in the climax of the final episode, Walter did kind of build a robot with the motorized machine gun arm, which actually saved Jesse's life, but led to Walter's demise. Number three, the bathtub scene. Walter and Jesse have to dispose of a body and decide to melt it with acid. Walter tells Jesse to get a plastic container to put the body in, as acid won't eat through plastic. But Jesse, in his infinite wisdom, uses his bathtub instead, which leads to the dead body's entrails melting out of the ceiling and exploding onto the floor. Number four, Gus's death. Now this is the moment that most people were bringing up. A deadly face-off with Walter, which literally led to uh, a face-off in an episode called Face Off. That entire saga is so anxiety-filled and is set up around the premise of how is Walter going to kill Gus? Is he going to be able to? Where Walter convinces Hector to arm his wheelchair with a bomb where we get that brilliantly acted moment in the final few seconds where Gus discovers that he's been outsmarted and has now met his end. 
It's both shocking and gruesome, and also kind of tragic, but equally memorable. And supposedly the makeup team behind The Walking Dead lent a hand for Gus's blown off two-face look. Breaking Bad could have actually ended as early as season three, as the AMC network were starting to lose interest in the show and proposed to wrap everything up at the end of the third season. So the producers then pitched Breaking Bad to FX, again, in order for that station to take over, of which AMC were then like, no, 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 we'll still broadcast the show, yeah, yeah, stick with us, don't go over to FX. <laughs> The viewership for season four skyrocketed further, thanks to Netflix also making the show available on their streaming platform. Now Breaking Bad had become a huge phenomenon. By the time season five came along, AMC wanted a shortened season with only half the usual episodes in order to save on some finances, but the production didn't want to do that. So instead it was decided to split season five into two halves. And so with season five, Vince Gilligan decided that it was now time to make Breaking Bad come to a close. At that stage, the character Walter White was now in his full-blown supervillain form. He was completely villainous and unlikable, and so I think it was the right time to finish the show. The premise to watch this average Joe, who the audience can root for, go on a journey into becoming a powerful antagonist had finally reached that peak. And so, where do you go from there? I mean, it got to the stage where Walter White was acting like he was some kind of demigod. So really, his transformation was complete. Also, Vince Gilligan wanted to end the show on a high note, at a time when people were wanting more episodes, rather than the show just dragging on with people losing interest. He reflected on his time working on X-Files, where he felt that show just dragged on a little too much. And so it was decided to end this chapter while still on a high note. And I think the fact that Breaking Bad didn't overexhaust itself and end just at the right time has cemented itself as one of the greatest TV shows of all time. Vince Gilligan also said that because of the moral ambiguity of Walter White, he was a really difficult character to write for, especially considering the dark places the character would go to. Upon reflecting on the show's end, he said, quote, I'm going to miss the show when it's over, but on some level, it'll be a relief to not have Walt in my head anymore. So on December the 29th, 2013, after five seasons and 62 episodes, Breaking Bad had come to a thrilling conclusion. So this leaves one question. The entire Breaking Bad element, if you will. Was Walter White a good guy or a bad guy? Was he sympathetic or just plain evil? Well, to be honest, it's not really as simple as that. I think at the start when Walter first engaged in his new life of crime, he was doing it with good intentions to provide for his family after learning of his cancer diagnosis. And it was funny seeing this guy who was clearly not part of the criminal world really being out of his element. But I think in taking on this new criminal lifestyle and the power and corruption it would eventually bring with it, woke something up inside Walter White. Something that was always there. Something that his morals and values and intentions to do the right thing kept this dark side of his nature dormant within him. But once he let go of his inhibitions and his ego took control, there were no more barriers from keeping that side of him at bay, making Walter White a truly complex character and a perfect character study of why a person becomes a criminal. Why do we sometimes go on that dark path and do terrible destructive things? This itself is a much more interesting direction of learning the psychology of a bad guy rather than the usual story trope where bad guys are just bad because. Now Walter White did some very bad things throughout the show, but at the same time he never lost his love of his children and tried to do the right thing for his family. Tried. Within his own twisted sense of justice. Walter White, for better or worse, just is. There is no black or white when it comes to this infamous character. Only grey areas. And Breaking Bad is a perfect voyeuristic exploration into that grey area that may be within all of us.
I love this show. I love the way it's written and I love its characters, as well as all their quirks, ticks and complexities. Breaking Bad is seriously the perfect human drama. Flaws, corruption and all. And I think it's within good reason that many claim it to be one of the greatest TV shows of all time. One of those rare shows that we get once in a blue moon where everything just falls into place perfectly. Anyway, I'm Minty. And I'm off to build a robot. See ya!